They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called uh, demand pull. And this is why individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and, you know, everyday Canadians and Americans worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm just thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up with a car or house or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know, maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb this is really simple. You have to get... Uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation is 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive two real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, I, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than we say. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces and you got to go buy a new vase. It's going to take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world. And this is what they did among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight at wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally. And uh, we feed, because it's not for humans, by the way, we feed our animals. So this is how you feed cows, pigs. This is how you get beef and pork. This is an example of the supply chain, how it filters all the way through. So you would expect higher prices to persist. You would expect food shortages. Uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea. Um, and um, the future supply chain is going to be, the, it goes by different names. Uh, Janet Yellen calls it friendshoring. Uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation. Uh, I call it the College of Nations. But basically, we'll have supply chains in trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China, you know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the 
Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants from Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, etc. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. There's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a, sli a slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment, energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the US debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. There's some exceptions, but they, they kind of like you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The US just hit uh, $31 trillion in, uh, in national debt. That is national debt, almost all of it in the form of US Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly US Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions. No big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. 
uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Maastricht Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when, you, when your debt to G, GDP ratio goes over 90 percent, your, your multiplier of an additional debt uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get closer to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then ninety percent and eighty five percent, et cetera. So ninety percent is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at one hundred and thirty one percent, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt, and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, 
but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as as they seem to think. But but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending. So the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds, and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds, and that gives the Treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, kind of... I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And then you say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. That's a legitimate debate. But they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is, we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but, but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means. MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a, um, a one, sorry, a two trillion dollar covid relief package and that was when you know the the, pay, the paycheck protection plan that was 800 billion and everyone got the the 1200 check you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then at the end of december at the very end of the trump administration they did another trillion dollars of uh, almost uh and that's when everyone got the 600 dollars checks and now you're up, up to 1800 dollars uh, by the way those checks that is helicopter money um that's you know what the fed does is is kind of nonsense, but when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money and credit to Larry Summers for saying, you're gonna get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January, 2021, and he's like not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another $2 trillion. And that's when we all got the $1,400 checks. They just handed them out. And then later that year, uh, or they did the, um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we what did we get recently was the, um, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um, about a, a twenty one trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to thirty trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says doesn't matter, but it does matter. And it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it, it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the US is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, uh, and the US will be in fiscal distress.
The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The US had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a tr- $1 trillion per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de- debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, So what? So the debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What what is the problem? Uh, this this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong. But it's it's got its followers and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have uh, benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the Treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be, that that's the the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. The treasury is just part of the executive branch uh, and the Fed is an independent agency. uh, And the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. uh, A lot of people know, some people know that, some people don't, but the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so or Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, uh, the treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2, or sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is, this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain why. Explain that uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. 
It's a liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay it on debt. When you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if, people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll give it. I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what? But what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right. The more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. The US is heading into recession. and we may be in a recession. Everyone's like, wait a second. <laughs> Yesterday, GDP was up 5%. And it was. That was the number for, for the, uh, the, it was the first government estimate for the third quarter of uh, 2023. It was up 5%, but it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventory. When uh, wholesalers and distributors build up inventory, that counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff, but if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters and in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you know, you go to the gap and you get like 10 shirts and five pairs of jeans for 30 bucks. I mean, the inventory situation comes down to the consumer. Are people buying stuff? It looks like the consumer hit the brakes in August. Now the second quarter is July, August, September. Sometime around mid to late August after two pretty strong months and they were strong, um, the, the, the consumers just hit the brakes. Now they've done enough to make the third quarter strong, but going into the fourth quarter, they may just, you know, not show up for the game. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is during the pandemic, you go back to 2020, 2021, what was going on? 
Well, starting with Trump in, uh, I think, June 2020, he gave everybody a $1,400 check. If, if you got a heartbeat, you got a check. And then Trump did it again in December 20, uh, 2020, sorry, um, just before he left office, it was another $600 check. Biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in uh, February or uh, in February 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. They, the savings rate got really low. Like They spent the savings they had. They didn't make new savings. And then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, that feels good for a while. But then if you're paying the minimum uh, and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limit's used up and the interest rates are 20%, some of, are, some of them are 28%, you're going to double that balance in three years. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out. Your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 25, you know, 20, 25%. So um, people are tapped down on the credit cards. They've used up their savings. They, um, they're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards. Uh, and they're just backing away. And it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption. It's way down. The demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut, whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline, even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately, prices have been coming down a little bit, which is another, that sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary, which kind of leans in the direction of a uh, recession. But um, for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the all the technicals with the you know negative uh, swap spreads and uh, inverted yield curves and all the rest. But uh, it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes around late August, early September. The fourth quarter could be a disaster. The stock market's starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple uh, recommendation, Matt. Reduce your exposure to stocks overall. Increase your exposure to cash. It'll give you, uh, you won't lose money on cash, um, assuming that inflation is not bad. And it'll give you a lot of optionality. You know, you can go, if things get really, really, really bad, if you have cash, you can go shopping and find some bargains. But uh, if you're in stocks and they go bad, you're just going to lose that money and never see it again. Um and uh, but if you if you do have a, if you do have stocks or some stocks, I would look at uh, energy, defense, um, not, not for good reasons, there's enough wars going on, but defense will do well and mining because, uh, um, you know, gold and silver prices and strategic minerals will do well. So defense, mining and um, uh, energy are the sectors I'd be in. I'd, I'd lighten up on tech, get out of everything else, go to cash. Uh, treasury notes look attractive here because interest rates are going to start to come down there. I know they've been going up. I get it, but it looks like they've peaked and have turned around. So treasury notes, a good two-year note, a five-year note will perform very well. And they're very safe, obviously. Um, and, uh, and just take it from there, but you've got to be, you've got to be tuned into the geopolitics to understand the stock market. You can treat them as separate subjects, but if the world's falling apart, so that's not good for stocks. Right. So when we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Um, you know, the short-term short treasuries, you know, four-month bills, six-month bills, up to one year. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six-month bill. Like, wait a second. You know, shouldn't, shouldn't I get more if I buy a 30-year bond or shouldn't I get more if I buy a 10-year note? Um, it's a longer maturity, more stuff can happen, inflation, bank freezes, all those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes, it's upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around um, six month bills, one year bills, going out to two year notes. When you get to the 10 year note, um, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two year note. The interesting thing about two years is you get a high rate, uh, but it's less volatile than a 10-year note. Uh, it's more liquid. Um, and 10-year notes are pretty liquid, but, but two-year notes are very liquid. Um, so you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways, and a higher interest rate. So it's 
like like I said, the best of both worlds. But the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe security securities. And they're paying like five and a quarter, you know, uh, not quite five and a half, but, you know, well, between five and a quarter and five and a half percent for six month for a six month treasury bill. Why wouldn't you just buy one of those? I mean, it's more than what you get in the bank. Now, the answer is, um, well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, you're going to lose money on, on your capital. The, the value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's that's bond math 101. You know, rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make or lose money, but that inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people, but that's just how it works. So yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%, very liquid, very safe, uh, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to, you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to lose, you're going to have a capital loss on the note itself. So so therefore, the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. Um, in my view, they peaked. Um they're going to come down. Uh, and if you like that action, you might prefer the 10-year note because uh, a longer maturity has a higher, you know, not to get too technical, it's called DBO1, dollar value, one basis point. What it means is that, so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said, bond prices go up, which they do, but how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. And so um, to your notes, a really attractive piece of paper, very safe. You get your money back, uh, liquid, you can get out of it, et cetera. You know, the only reason not to buy would be if you thought rates are going to go up. I don't. I think they're coming down from here on out. But uh, if you accept that view, then the 10-year note is going to have the biggest capital gains. Now, again, it's riskier. When I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are going to get your money back, but from a, but from a, market risk point of view if you had to sell it you know a year from now or six months from now for that matter uh if rates go up you're going to lose a little money on the um on the value of the note itself but uh but if rates come down not only do you get the five percent interest rate which is sweet but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down so the big question is have rates peaked and i would say they have and I based that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risk. Stocks are coming down. Then interest rates are going to come down too. The financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008 and we're going to fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, OK, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory and capital markets, how that works. But where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how does the how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody a university makes a loan to a student and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults um, and the credit union, the lender simply turns to the treasury and said, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the Treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of 
the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all. I can describe them. I can see how they're going to converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York. But she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy? The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yep. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105% highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%, 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory, and he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so. You proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus, we wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may have we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin. I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand, and I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, buy a new car, buy a house. Get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. 
And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land, real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All of these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory. So my forecast, you know, I, I do update them, but the, but big picture, it goes as follows. So what is Jay Powell doing? First of all, March 1st, 2022, the Fed fund policy rate, interest rates were zero. And we're now at four and a half percent. Even in the Volcker days, we never went up four and a half percent in 10 months. Not that fast. And so here we are. So what is Powell doing? Well, he's given five speeches on the subject. I don't know why Wall Street doesn't listen, but he keeps trying. He said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're just going after inflation. You know, believe us. Um, there is going to be a recession. Unemployment is going to go up. There's going to be pain. I, you know, I've never heard a Fed chairman use the word pain. He used it five times in one paragraph in the Jackson Hole speech. Um, and that's what we're doing. And, and, and believe us when we say it. According to Jim Rickards, a global recession is coming and it's going to be painful. Unemployment will go up. The economy is slowing down. And the Federal Reserve has already used every single tool that they have. Inflation has come down, but for a really bad reason. We will get into the reason later in the video. There's the myth of something called the terminal rate. Simply put, it's a rate that the Federal Reserve needs to reach so that inflation will come down on its own without further rate hikes. Wall Street said the Fed is already at the terminal rate, so they don't need to raise it anymore. But the Fed is saying no. We haven't reached the terminal rate yet, so we have to keep raising it until we reach the 2% inflation target. So the question is, how long will the Fed keep raising the interest rates? We're already over 5% now, and the Fed's still planning to raise it even more? With the current high interest rate, these tech companies already laying off a lot of their employees because they have to tighten their finances. What if the Fed raises it even more? Let's find out. Now, how long will he raise rates? How quickly? And, and what's he trying to do? Powell is trying to get to something that he calls the terminal rate. But the definition of the terminal rate is it's a rate that's high enough to cause inflation to come down on its own without further hikes. So uh, we'll get to a level and then inflation is coming down, by the way. And in, uh, in the last five months, it's gone from in the U.S., it's gone from about 9% to 87 8.2, 74 7.1. So it is coming down. Having said that, the target is 2%, and 7.1 is still a far cry from 2. So he's he's not there, but he's making progress. So here's the, I hate to use the word conundrum, but it kind of is. Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you wanted. Give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. Right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause um, and then, and then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down sooner than uh, uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. Uh, and you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why, why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to uh, 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. Jim Rickard said something about the Volcker mistake and why Jerome Powell is still raising the interest rate and not cutting it yet. The famous Fed pivot, as Wall Street calls it. Jay Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake by cutting the interest rates too early and failing to bring inflation down. 
Do you know why the interest rate was raised to 20% back in the 1980s? It's because of the Volcker mistake. The tale goes as follows. In the late 1970s, inflation was going up a lot and therefore the interest rates rose from around 4.5% to 10%. But that 5% raise took three years, from 1976 to 1979. Meanwhile, the current rate hike that we have now is the fastest in history. We went from 0 to 5 and a quarter percent in just one year. Back in the 80s, we had a recession, and the chairman of the Fed, Paul Volcker, had to cut the interest rate down by 7%. Not 0.7%, but 7 full percentage points. He cut the interest rate from 17% to around 10%. And after that pivot, he raised it back to 20%, and three years later in 1987, the rates finally came back to normal. Back then, we needed 10 years in order to finally win the inflation fight. And now what? We're expecting it to win in a couple of months? The Fed just raised the rates fastest in history and people expect to bring it back down? Let's get into the detail. People forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then they took the ceiling off and then things got back to, to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and he and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, and he said this in his last book, just before he died, um, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger. And then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then. But at the time, that was horrific. But but Volcker and others have said that was a blunder. He never should have done it. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, so that's the lay of the land. There's the, there's the two competing sides. How does this play out? We learned a lot from Jim about the current situation and what Jerome Powell will be doing. But there's more to that story. Powell doesn't even understand what's going on in the real world, which is inflation itself. There are two sources of inflation, the supply side and the demand side. We are at the supply side inflation, which means the supply of goods is scarce, but the demand is high and therefore the prices go up. But supply side inflation can transform into demand side inflation, and this is where the dangers begin. People's spinning behavior changes and they're worried that something worse will happen, and then they grab everything they can. And therefore the demand rises, and you got yourself inflation caused by an increase in the demand side. That's what most people don't understand, including Wall Street. Wall Street said inflation will come down on its own because we've reached the terminal rate. But Jerome Powell thinks we are not done yet, and therefore he will raise rates even more. And what does Jim Rickards think? Does he think Powell is at the terminal rate yet? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, don't um, 
if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. As I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. So they, they think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's, here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, the, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. They both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Uh, you know, bare shelves and you couldn't get uh, certain things. It, was, it wasn't that every supermarket shelf was bare the way it was in East Germany in the 1950s, but something was always missing. And that's still the case today. So, of course, prices went up and, uh, you know, people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called um, a cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. Uh, and basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. Um, and so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side. But by the late 70s, 80s in Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because people can't afford it. Like, you know, maybe if demand is inelastic, if you got to fill up your Ford F-150 truck with gasoline to take the kids to school or go to work. But if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gas because you're not leaving the house. So, so it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if, if, if I'm right, and I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. If I have to, if I used to pay $75 to fill up my truck with gas, and now I have to pay $150, which is about right, I'll do it because I got to get to work. But that's $75 I, I'm not going to spend on something else. I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm not going to go to a show, a concert, or you know, buy a... Um, you know, a, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new camera, whatever, whatever it might be. So it, it does tend to depress, um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war. I had to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. And what he's got looks a little bit more like the Herbert Hoover war that looks a little bit more like the 1930s than the 1970s. So the bottom line on all this is the Fed is going to raise rates at least twice more for the reasons I mentioned. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle is not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there if there is such a thing as the terminal rate. It's another one of these things they made up. Um, uh, inflation is coming down on so will probably continue, but for really bad reasons. China doesn't have any of that. None of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game 
ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a place, a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, there are three star generals, CIA, FBI. You know. I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agree. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what, were the, what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold, and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the U.S. treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is, that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said, Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed four trillion dollars in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. And it's all empty. I mean, this is all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. 
it's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it, and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might have looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. The treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't ch trust the Chinese as far as you can as throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You're right op edge. You're pro fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. 
They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now those are the numbers. That's not that's not projections. That that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it again, as I say, keep the lights on? Yes. Did would it would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. By the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the $7 trillion, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about 6 or 7%. We're not getting back to 2000. 19 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's for saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP. And it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning 
you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that G that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad adaptations people look at say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. So 90% is the critical threshold. The US is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever whatever's the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the US debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. There's some exceptions, but they they kind of like you know an inch a year, a couple inches a year. But they but they move mountains. I mean, they just they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country. I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The U S just hit a uh, $31 trillion in uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or 
uh, you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 